All right, welcome back to our study of imperative semantics. Before getting started, I'm going to say a short personal prayer. Heavenly Abba, Yahweh, Elohim, Creator of Heaven and Earth, we give you all the great my prayer. Let me pray that this day you see me do it. I copy that shit my way. Even at this very moment, send me within me to abide as I strive to be with God. Flock to avoid pastures of your word, cause them to bring in memory all the things I've heard during my study time with you. Look to my lips that nothing escapes me except that which is good and true. Therefore, from the lesson this day, Father, I do pray that you allow your flock to be free. Not that they might be impressed with me, but that they might be blessed by thee. I only pray that you utilize me to illuminate the darkness with your words of light, that it displaces any fright and that it strengthen the hands that they might be fight to enter into thy kingdom. Therefore, for me this day, Father, I do pray that you allow your light to shine extra bright again, not that they might see me, but that they might find you, the one in whom all glory and honor is due. Yahuwah, my Ellen King, I pray that you accept for me this day my offer. Yahushua's name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. So we're back to our imperative semantics studies. Imperative, speaking of something that's of vital importance and semantics. It's the branch of linguistics concerned with logic and meaning. And so that's what we want to get down to, um, the actual logic and meaning of some of the terms of scripture that are imperative. You know, that is of a vital importance. That's crucial. Amen? Amen. All right. And today, we're going to be um, going over yet another imperative semantic. And it is... Oblation. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's oblation. I bet none of y'all seen that one coming, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it truly is an imperative semantic. Hallelujah. So, oblation is cor um, Corbin or Kaban in the Hebrew number 7133. It speaks to something brought near. That is a sacrificial present. It's from the root word karah, number 7126, meaning to come near, to draw near, to approach, to enter into. Okay? Now, Leviticus 1 2 um, utilizes Quran. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering, Quran, unto Yahuwah, he shall bring your offering, your Quran. Of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. Okay? So, we see here that this word um, offering is Korban, number 7133. So, thus, the offerings of Elohim, which are made up of various physical and spiritual sacrifices, for example, burnt um, offerings, sin, trespass, things, praise, righteousness. Etc. found throughout scripture are simply requests for either the offerer or Elohim to approach, come or draw near, and or enter into. You know, and that is pretty crucial when you think about it. You know, because if you can't get near Elohim, or if he can't get near you, then you don't. Amen. Amen. You know, with this in mind, now consider Yah's entire sacrificial system is predicated upon one's corban. That is, upon one's approaching, coming, coming or drawing near, and or entering into Elohim. You know, this is this whole sacrificial system is predicated upon either we drawing near to him or him drawing near to us or, or both, you know, with the ultimate uh, goal of entering into one another. Amen? Amen. Unless you think that this is one-sided, you know, that we're just doing all the offering. Also consider the fact that Yahuwah has also presented us with gifts of Korban, an attempt to approach or draw near and or enter into us. You know, and we find this in Yochanan 316, it says, for Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yahuwah sending, sending his son, Yahushua, to die for our sins was nothing more than an offering, a korban, for him to approach, um, come or draw near and or enter into us. You have to be able to see it. You know, that's what that was. It was a korban. It was an attempt to draw near. Hence, we read in Yochanan 15, 4 through 6, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch bear cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abideth, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So you see, the end goal is for Elohim to be in us and for us to be in Elohim. And if we don't accomplish that end goal, then we're only fit for the fire. Everybody still with me? All right, so also consider Yoganah 14, 19 through 23, my first reading, please. My first reading, yes. Yet a little while the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye also, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Adonai, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Yahushua answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Hallelujah. You know, Judas asks a question. How is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And the answer is found in the Messiah's command. You know, and the Messiah is drawing near. This is found in Matthew 26, 26 through 28. It says, And as they were eating, Yahushua took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of my renewed covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sin. You see, you have to understand that this was and is Elohim's Korban to humanity. This is his request and or invite for one to approach him, for one to come or draw near to him, for one to enter into him and for him to enter into us. You know, this is his Korban. This is his attempt to draw near unto us, you know, to, to come and enter into us. Hence he says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he will be with me. You know, so this is the end goal. This was Elohim's Korban. That's what we read about in Matthew 26, 26 through 28. That is what the Eucharist is. It is Elohim's Korban. It is his request to, to approach us and come and come and draw near unto us and to enter into us. Amen. You know, so we have to understand that it's imperative that when we give an offering unto Yahuwah, that it isn't to be done from a sense of responsibility as is commonly done today, but rather from desire. See, a lot of people, when they give their korban today, when they give when they give their offering, they give it out of a sense of responsibility. They give it, you know, because they feel like that's what they're supposed to do. See, but when you truly understand 
korban, then you understand that you give it because of desirability. And that desirability is the desire to come or draw near to Elohim. It's the desire to approach him. It's, it's supposed to be from the desire like, to enter into him and have him enter into us. You know, can, I pray that you can see that. You know, because Korban speaks to us drawing near and him drawing near unto us. So we don't do it out of a sense of responsibility. We do it out of a out of a desire to be with him and to have him be with us. That said, I would be remiss if I didn't expound on how to scripturally present Korban to Elohim and what to expect when either you begin or Yah begins to approach, come or draw near and or enter into us or we into him. There's some things that you can expect to happen. You know, and so uh, a study of this term would not be complete without getting into that a bit. You know, so let us consider Leviticus 17, 2 through 9, my next reader, please. Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, and say unto and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which Yahuwah has commanded. Say, One man, so ever there be of the house of Israel, that killeth an ox, or lamb, or goat, in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer an offering unto Yahuwah before the tabernacle of Yahuwah, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood, that man shall be cut off from among his people. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto Yahuwah, and to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and to the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto Yahuwah. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of Yahuwah, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto Yahuwah. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone no more. This shall be a statute forever unto, the, unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be in the house of Israel, or the strangers which sojourn among you, that offer the burnt offering of sacrifice, and bringeth it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto Yahuwah. Even that man shall be cut off from among his people. Hallelujah. Okay, so we see in verse 3 it said, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp and bringeth it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it an offering. Is what offer and an offering is korban and its root um, karab, you know, and take note. It's really saying, you know, anyone come to the door, uh, bring it not unto the door to draw near unto Yahuwah before the tabernacle. Yahuwah, blood shall be imputed upon that man. He shed, he have shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from his people. You know, um, he says to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto Yahuwah, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto Yahuwah. You know, so he's letting us know that if you're going to bring a Quran, if you're going to seek to draw near to Elohim, there is a specific way that you have to do it. Okay. You, 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 can't, you can't just take your offering anywhere. You know, you have to bring it to the door of the tabernacle or the congregation. 
you know, and offer it unto Yahoo before this tabernacle. You know, and verse 7 said, and they shall no more go, um, they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have gone upon. This shall be a statue forever throughout the generation. See, a lot of times, you know, uh, especially in, in today's time, you know, people have misconception uh, and misunderstanding of a lot of these terms. And I think, you know, <clears throat> as well as, you know, the way of Elohim. And so they do what's right in their own sight. Hmm. And they assume that it's pleasing to Elohim because it seemeth right unto them. But as scripture teaches, there's a way that seemeth right unto man. Uh, man's heart, but the ways thereof uh, are death. You know, so Yah is an L of specificity. He want to be worshipped and served in a specific manner. And we don't get to make that matter up. You know, and so you have a lot of people who feel like, you know, they can, you know, they can draw near to Elohim by, you know, giving their offerings here, there, and everywhere. But that doesn't work for Elohim. He says, only bring it unto the door of his tabernacle uh, of the congregation. You know, so I think that's a pretty important concept to understand in offering your kaban. You know, when you when you're offering Koban, you know, you have to bring it bring it to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto Yahweh. Otherwise, you know, you may be sacrificing unto devils. Say mm -hmm. that. Also, a second witness to this is found in Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verses 13 through 19. My next reader, please. Take heed to, to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which Yahuwah shall choose in one of thy tribes, there, sh there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Notwithstanding, thou mayst kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after according to the blessing of Yahuwah, thy Elohim, which he hath given thee, the unclean and the clean may eat thereof as of the roebuck and as of the heart. Only ye shall not eat the blood. Ye shall pour it upon the earth as of water. Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn, or of the want, thy wine, or of thy oil, or the firstlings, of thy herds or of the flock, nor any of thy vows which thou vowest, nor thy free will offerings or heave offering of thine hand. But thou must eat them before Yahuwah thy Elohim in the place which Yahuwah thy Elohim shall choose. Thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates and thou shalt rejoice before Yahuwah thy Elohim in all that thou puttest thine hands unto. Take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. Hallelujah. So here, everybody, we see it in verse 13. It said, take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place thou, that thou seest. You know, you, you, you don't go here, there, and everywhere. But in the place which Yahuwah shall choose in one of thy tribes, there shalt thou um, offer thy burnt offerings. You know, and so that's <clears throat> that's important. You know, now, you know, it's imperative that one understands that, you know, they were allowed to do what they wanted with the blessings um, that uh, with the blessings that Yah had, had given, given unto them. You know, but outside of of the prescription that Yah gave for Quran, it will not, you know, be 
consider korban, it would not be something that will cause them to draw near to Elohim. It would not be something that will cause Elohim to draw near to them. So if the purpose of your good deeds, you know, um, or the purpose of your sacrifices is to be korban, to draw near to Elohim, then you have to do it in accordance to how he instructs you. You know, now sometimes people do, you know, good deeds or nice gestures, you know, for korban unto someone else or some other organization or entity, you know, because they want to approach or draw near to them. You know, they want to win favor with someone, you know, or they want to win favor with some organization. And so, you know, they they may, you know, give Corban, you know, like a, a campaign contribution. You know, that's uh, one example of how people offer Corban in, in hopes of, you know, drawing near, you know, to a, a prospective winner. You know, so kind of... Uh, so they, they can have favor with them in, in case they win. You know, so I'm just putting that out there so that you can see that, you know, there's many ways that you can utilize the blessings that Yah gave you. But if you want them to be utilized as Korban, that is to draw near to Elohim and have Elohim draw near to thee, then it has to be done, offered and eaten in the place that Yahuwah has chosen, and that's where he's put his name. Amen? Amen. So, what to expect? What to expect when your Korban is actually working? What to expect when you're actually, you know, coming or drawing near, or Yah is coming or drawing near unto thee? You know, it's, the Korban is, is, is actually working and you're drawing near and Yah is drawing near to you. What can you expect? What does that look like? I got the perfect illustration for it. This is what it looks like. In case you're wondering, you're the bush. Elohim is the fire. You're burning, but you're not consumed. This is what it looks like to be in Elohim and Elohim be in you. This is what it looks like. This is what you can expect. You know, uh, to validate this and further illustrate it, let's consider the story where this is taken from, you know, which is Exodus 3. It says, now Moshe kept the flock of Yethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. And the angel of Yahuwah appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Hmm. And Moshe said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when Yahuwah saw that he turned aside to see Elohim, when Yahuwah saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, here am I. He said, draw not nigh hither. Mm -hmm. Stop right there, buddy. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where thou standest. Is holy ground. Hallelujah. Now, just as uh, a side note, you cannot go before Elohim with your shoes on. The shoes represent the things of the world. 
it represents the, the natural or carnal you. This has to come off before you step on holy ground. Amen? That has to come off your feet before you go in the presence of Elohim. Verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am Elohim of thy father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Esau, the Elohim of Jacob. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon Elohim. And Yahuwah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Mitzrayim, and heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Mitzrayim and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Yebusites. Okay, so verse 7 said, Yahuwah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Mitzrayim. Now, I'm going to spin off of this because we're here, you know, because I was going to do a whole other segment, but I figured, no, I'm just going to spin off of this right here and go from here to show you an illustration within the illustration of what it means to draw near to Elohim. All right, so verse 7. Yahuwah said, I have surely seen affliction of my people which are in Mitzrayim um, or Egypt. Where in Egypt or Mitzrayim was Yah's people? Say again. Goshen. Goshen. They were in Goshen. What does Goshen mean? To draw near. Can you see that this was, that them being in Goshen was a picture of of them, of their korban unto Elohim or Elohim's korban unto them. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, actually, Yosef was Yah's korban and they, their korban was staying in Goshen for the length of time that they did. Okay? All right, so what happened once they accepted Yah's offer? Now, this is right where, you know, Yah is sending Moshe. He's sending them into Mitzrayim to deliver his people. Amen? What happens after they accept the proposal? Anyone? Absolutely. It got tougher. Things got really heated, did they not? You know, when they first went and told Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, okay, okay, y'all don't want to work, huh? Y'all don't want to work? All right, so now you got to make bricks with no hay. How about that? You're talking about you want to go worship um yeah you want to you want to you want to go present you want to go korban you want to go korban with yah korban these these bricks with no hay draw near to them did he did isn't that what happened you know all the way up until they left mitzrayim and it's, it still didn't get easier did it got even tougher did it That's when their trials really began, right? See, because that's how it looks to Quran unto Elohim. I'm trying to show you what it looks like to Quran unto Elohim. Remember, I said this is the illustration. Why do you think Yah was showing Moshe this? Why do you think he showed him this to get his attention? Because this is what he's going to do to Moshe 
to illustrate the same thing to all of Israel. And I'm going to show you where he did that. I'm going to show you where he made this Moshe and all of Israel was on looking. And that's found in Exodus 24, 12 through 18. It says, And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Come up to me into the mountain, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and the law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moshe rose up, and his minister um, Joshua or Yahushua, and Moshe went up into the, the mount of Elohim, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto him. And Moshe went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. Okay, let me pause right there for a minute, because I got to give you a little backdrop to the story for those who don't recall it. You know, first of all, um, they were already partially up in the mountain. Okay, and this is where Yah had told Moshe to come up with Aaron and her and all the elders. Amen. You know, and so they went up there and they 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 ate with Elohim. You know, they ate before Elohim and they seen Elohim, you know, and then, you know, Yah tells Moshe, you know, I need you to come all the way up. I need you to come all the way up and I'm gonna give you these tables of stone. You know, now, just as a side note, because it's here and I can't just pass it up. Verse 13. Said Moses rose up and his minister Joshua and Moshe went up into the Mount of Elohim. I don't even call y'all saying nothing about take Joshua. Why did Joshua have to go? You say because he was a prophet like under Moshe. What does that have to do with Joshua? Yes, it is. Then what does that have to do? <laughs> Joshua's going to take over. Yeah, but he ain't know that then. Say again. I didn't hear you. Be a witness. Not quite. The reason he had to take Joshua because there's only one way through the Father, and that's through Yahoo's. You cannot go before Yahuwah without Yahushua. Amen? Amen. Is that word? Amen. You know, verse 17. Uh, or did I stop at 16? Verse 16. And the glory of Yahuwah abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moshe out of the midst of the cloud. Now check this out, and this is where I need you to stay with me. And the sight of the glory of Yahuwah was like devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moshe went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moshe was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. 40 speaks to trials, tests and trials. He went up into the cloud, which was in the sight of um, which the sight of the glory of Yahuwah was like a devouring fire on top of the mount. This is what it looked like to them down on the ground. This is what it looked like to Aaron and her and the elders. And the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of Yahuwah was like a consuming fire in the top of the, in the mountaintop. And this red dot is Moshe, and he traveled up this route and went right up into there. Wow. Now, not only did he go up in there, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I want you to think about what comes next in the story. The people begin to rebel. Mm -hmm. And they say, as of this man Moshe, we don't know what happened mm -hmm. to him. 
What you think they thought when they seen him go up into that and didn't come down for 40 days and 40 nights? They thought he was consumed. They thought he was well done. Crispy critter. See, but they didn't, they didn't know what y'all had showed them in the beginning. They didn't know that he was like that burning bush. That yes, even though he was going to go into the fire, he wasn't going to be burned. And this is the same illustration with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is the same illustration for any and everyone who wants to present korban, who wants to draw near, who wants to approach, come, or draw near, and or enter into Elohim. They're going to have to go into the fire. You got to understand that. There's no way around it. Why isn't there a way around it? There's no way around it. For scripture teaches for our Elohim is a consuming fire. If you draw near to him, you're going to have to draw near to the fire. And where there's fire, there's heat. And so this is why you catch a lot of heat when you draw near to Elohim. This is why Moshe caught a lot of heat when he went and told Pharaoh, let my people go. This is why Israel caught a lot of heat when they left from out of Mitzrayim, when they accepted y'all's offer. This is why Yahshua caught a lot of heat when he came down here to show us the way to everlasting life. And this is why you'll catch a lot of heat if you korban, if you approach come or draw near to Elohim to enter into him and have him enter into you. I want to present to you another picture of the same thing. Yochanan 129, the next day, see if Yahushua coming unto him and say, behold, the Lamb of Elohim, which taketh away the sin of the world. Right? So this is speaking about our Messiah, the Lamb of Elohim, Revelation 5, 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven rukot of Elohim sent forth into all the earth. So, behold, the Lamb of Elohim came to the earth. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, as if he had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven root coat of Elohim, which is sent forth into all the earth and to the seven churches. Amen? All right. When he was here, when our Messiah walked the earth, you know, with his disciples, his 12 disciples, you know, he sent them forth in such a manner. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Sheep, ye therefore, um, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Luke 10, 1 through 3. After these things, Adonai appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into the city and, and place where we're, whither he, he himself will come. Therefore, he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore to Adonai of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs Amongst the wolves. Matthew 10 6. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is where he sent them to. So I want you to see that our Adonai, our Messiah Yahushua, he is a lamb of Elohim. A lamb as if he had been slain. Amen. He came, he chose 12 disciples, he sent them forth as sheep. He chose 70 others. He sent them forth as sheep. And he sent them to go get what? Sheep. Can't you see that everybody is sheep? 
All right? That's us. This is us right here. Amen? Amen. That's me over there. <laughs> <laughs> Lambs of Elohim. That's what we are. Yeah. Lambs of Elohim. And we're journeying to Yah's house. That's what we're trying to get to. Because we want to, we, we want to carbon, right? We want to draw near to Elohim. Okay. So if we're going to draw near to Elohim, we know, we know um where he's at. He's at home. So we're on our way to his house. Because we want to be near to him. Amen. Amen. All right. So now the question becomes, where does Elohim live? He lived in his temple, right? So we have a uh, we have a map of his temple. You know, so we get us lambs of Elohim, we get to the front door right here, right? And this this is where Yah is, back in the Holy of Holies, I mean. You know, so we make our way to the front door. We right here. We oh, we get through the door. What's the first thing we run into? The brazen arms. Amen? If we're going to draw near to Elohim, there's no way you're going to get past this fire. Amen? We're lambs. And it just so happened that this brazen altar was made for lambs. And it's filled with fire. So what is this telling us? I want you to fixate this picture in your mind. You got it? I'll give you a couple more seconds. You got it? All right. Now, I want you to consider all my lambs of Elohim. I want you to consider Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. To put it in other words, we're told to remove our shoes, for we are now standing on holy ground. For the shoes represented the carnal aspects of us. Mm -hmm. See, and this is why we're being told, be ye not conformed to this world. You have to remove those carnal aspects, mm -hmm. aspects, you know, by, uh, and become transformed by the renewing of our mind. So the things that's important of this world become as crap to us. Mm -hmm. It becomes as dung as, as uh, Apostle Paul says. All right. Now, the brazen altar itself typifies the Levites, i.e., those who are attached or joined to Elohim, and represent what's naturally good. They represent what's what's naturally good. They collectively make up the receptacle that holds the fire. So, if anyone is a Levite, they're attached to or joined to Elohim, and so they are always holding the fire of Elohim. Because Elohim is a consuming fire. You're not, there's no way you can be joined to him or attached to him and not have a fire because that's what he is. Amen? Amen. And the fire, of course, represents Elohim, who is love. So there's no way that you're going to draw near to Elohim and not go through that fire or that love. Amen? Amen. Now, I want you to take note that there's something betwixt the fire or Elohim and that and, and that and that's the wood. There's something betwixt us and the fire, I should say. There's something betwixt us and the fire. When you consider the brazen altar, the fire is in is in the um, is in the altar, bottom of the altar, you know, but there's something betwixt the sacrifice and the fire, and that is the wood, all right? The wood is the fuel for the fire. See, Yah isn't consuming us. He's consuming the wood. The wood is the fuel for the fire, but we catch the heat from the wood. 
Anybody with me? Yes. We catch the heat from the wood. And it's the heat from the wood of the fire that cooks the sacrifices, mm -hmm. that cooks the lamb. Mm -hmm. The wood typified those who are unfruitful. You find that in Matthew Yahoo 3, 7 through 10, it says, but when he saw many other Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, this is speaking of Yochanan and the Mercer, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, mm -hmm. Who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that Elohim is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not fruit is hewn down. And remember the parable we brought, we read about the vine and the ones that didn't bring forth much fruit was cut off and was thrown where? Into the fire. They become fuel for the fire. So hereby we learn that the way we're to destroy our enemies, that is, is with our korban, by our approaching or coming or drawing near and or entering into Elohim and allowing his consuming fire or his love, because that's what the fire represents, his love to cook our flesh. But in cooking our flesh, it's also going to destroy our enemies. Hence, we're told to in Matthew 5, 44, to love our enemies and bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. See, this is the fire. See, this is why scripture says, you know, when you do this, It'll be like heaping hot coals upon your enemy's head. Yeah. See, but the natural world, they don't understand yeah. spiritual warfare. So this sounds like foolishness to them. But I'm here to tell you, I've done it. And I can bear witness that it works. Yeah. It truly works. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Yeah. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And watch that fire burn. Also consider first keepers 4 12 through 16 because we're lambs. We're lambs upon the altar. If we're trying to korban, if we're trying to draw near to Elohim and we go to his house, the first place we gotta go um go before is the altar. The first thing we gotta do is climb on it. And this is why Kephas or Peter says what he says here in, in chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. He says, Beloved, think it not a strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Remember when Moshe went into the fire? Remember when he when he corbond, when he began to draw near to Elohim, and God used him to go into Mizraim? And Pharaoh started putting the heat on him and, and, and all of Israel. Remember when Israel, when they accept the, accepted the offer to draw near to Elohim, and then came the fire, and they thought it, thought everything was, was going haywire, like, you know, you, you said you come to deliver us, and you made it worse for us. Remember? Yeah. You know, and then they went into the wilderness, you know, where it was a desert, it was hot like mm. fire. Amen. And they had to go through all these trials, mm -hmm. these hot trials. See, this is why Keith was saying, beloved, thinking not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. You can't draw near to Elohim, who's a consuming fire, and not find yourself catching some heat. Because where there's fire, there's heat. Verse 13, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Messiah's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And if ye be reproached for the name of Messiah, happy are ye, for the Ruach of glory and of Elohim rests upon you. 
And on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Mm -hmm. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Mm -hmm. Yet if any man suffers Mashiach as a messianic, brother, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify Elohim on this behalf. Yeah. You got something to celebrate. Yeah. You ought to rejoice because you're truly Korban. You're, you're, you're truly approaching. You're truly coming or drawing near and or entering into Elohim. Yeah. And that's why you're feeling the heat. It's not strange. It's just what's supposed to happen. So don't let it deter you. See, a lot of people feel the heat and they turn and run and go the other way yeah. thinking something is wrong. Yeah. See, but that's because they don't understand Korban. They don't understand what it means to draw near. They don't understand what it means for Elohim to enter into him, uh, into them and them into him. They don't understand that he's a consuming fire. They don't understand what fire comes heat. They don't understand the way of Elohim. But let this not be thee. So I pray that you understand Korban. What it is, how to present it, and what to expect when he finally look upon you mm. in your devil straits. That, by the way, that's what Miss Ryan means. And he decides it's time for me to pull this lamb out of affliction and start drawing you near to himself. So when it begins to happen, you know what's going on and you don't get deterred and run away. That's all I have for you today. Pray yeah. with a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, y'all.